Hey guys, I'm Davey Wavy, creator of the Gay Erotic website, Himeros.tv, and today I am joined by sex intimacy coach Finn Dearhart and the executive director of Rainbow Faith and Freedom, Reverend Dr. Brent Hoffs. And today we're talking about two things that make most people squirm, religion and sex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe we'll even throw politics in there to really <laughs> round, <laughs> round it out. So let's get started. Himeros Live is brought to you by Himeros.tv. Created by Davey Wavy, Himeros.tv is an erotic playground for gay and bisexual men with weekly explicit videos featuring authentic man-on-man -man action. Each video is co-created with gay sex experts to evolve your experience of sex and sexuality through pleasure, connection, and exploration. Join Himeros.tv for 20% off. That's as little as $11.96 per month at Himeros.tv forward slash pod. That's H-I-M-E-R-O-S.tv forward slash pod. Himeros.tv, it's like porn, but better. Hey guys, welcome. Hi. So great to have you, Brent. Thank you, good to see you again. Yeah, I'm so excited to have you here today. This is, this is a big first for us. So I'm gonna read a little bit of your bio here. Uh, and let's see, Reverend Dr. Brent Hawks is the founder and executive director of Rainbow Faith and Freedom and senior pastor emeritus of Metropolitan Community Church of Toronto where he was at the forefront of ministry to the LGBTQ2 community for over 40 years. On January 14, 2001, he officiated at the first legal same-sex marriages in the world. He received the Order of Canada, the Order of New Brunswick, and three honorary degrees for his stand on social justice and human rights within the LGBTQ2 communities. I mean, come on, <laughs> like that is pretty impressive. Like a beacon. Yeah, you have done obviously some incredible work uh, on which we're going to get into, but on behalf of, I mean, really all of us who have benefited from what you've done, thank you for, for everything that you do and everything that you continue to do. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pretty amazing journey. Yeah, it seems like it. So when you performed, you performed the first legal same-sex marriages in the world. Yeah, there are a lot of firsts around uh, equal marriage, and it's not a competition. Uh, but yeah, when we when I did the weddings on January fourteenth, two thousand and one, um, I had to wear a bulletproof vest. I had uh, there were fifty police officers in the church because of the death threats. I had twelve mm -hmm. bodyguards. I half jokingly say eleven of the toughest looking lesbians you've ever seen in your life, and one gay man coordinating it all. Um, <laughs> It's a crazy day, uh, exciting, terrifying. I called my parents the night before to say I loved them if anything happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and so we performed the marriages and uh, there were protesters outside. Uh, and as soon as I walked into the sanctuary, the place erupted. There were a thousand people. They went nuts because it was so exciting. And everyone was, ugh, I get emotional. Everyone was excited just to be there, uh, but also terrifying. Mm -hmm. And so we did the marriages without incident, and uh, the government of the day refused to marry, to, refused to recognize them. So we took them to court, and we sued the federal government, the provincial government, and the city government. And our case, we asked our case to be joined together with a case of eight other couples who tried to get married but couldn't. And we eventually won the court case, and we won the appeal case. And when we won the appeal case, the the court ordered the government to backdate the approvals to include our marriages. Wow. And so. We chose January the 14th because we had heard that the Netherlands was going to legalize same-sex marriage, so we chose the date two weeks before them. Not, <laughs> not that we're competitive. I mean, we not Canadian. a competition, but if it was, you got to <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. definitely give it first. That's, and what's incredible, too, is to think, I mean, that was only 19 years ago in terms of mm -hmm. human history. That's, that's nothing. And mm -hmm. When I go to Canada now, it's like, you know, everyone comes out for pride. Like it, it's it's amazing how much progress there has been made in such a short amount of time, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. When when I when people in the women's movement and, and the civil rights movement are kind of jealous with how fast we've made progress, but we've been able to make the progress because we've ridden on their coattails. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. We're talking about, you know, uh, freedom for to our, of our own bodies, our own choices over our own bodies. And the civil rights movement talking up, you know, about uh, equality and, and so on. I mean, we can sweep in on their coattails and uh, and stuff. And so that's why in some countries, you know, we're not going to be able to make the advancements we want for LGBT human rights until we see women's rights advanced. Mm -hmm. That's so, a good point. Yeah. There's a lot of intersection. Yeah. So I do want to talk a little bit about your work. But first, I, I'm sure that you don't even remember this, but we first met probably... Uh, it's got to be like 10 years ago 
Uh, I was living in Toronto for the summer and I went to a dog park with my Greyhound Chipotle. And I think we just started talking, neither of us really knowing anything about the other. And you invited me to your church, which was the, the Metropolitan Community Church of Toronto. And I just remember being so kind of skeptical because as a, mm. uh, as, a as a recovering Catholic, like I just have a tremendous amount of baggage in religion as do a lot of us, I'm sure, you know, Finn included, which mm. Finn will talk about your dad who's an evangelist in Texas. Yes, but, yes. but so you invited me to this mm. service and, and I went, I kind of surprised myself. I went and I was shocked because when I went in the church, first of all, it was full of LGBT people and there were families and guys holding hands and 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 yet also you know across i was just very confused by everything that i saw and um mm. and so someone came up to the podium and read i guess like the it was initially the, the gospel and i remember the story being like i remember afterwards being like oh yeah this is why i don't go to church because this story was whatever it was anti what it just wasn't my cup of tea and then you got up <laughs> and you said, well, you know, we've come a long way since this was written and this was written by different people in a different time and a different culture. And mm. here's what I know to be true. And you kind of did your own spin on it. And I just started crying yeah. and I cried for the entire service. Um, and afterwards uh, you asked me, you were like, oh, how was it? And I was like, well, you know, I kind of cried through the whole thing. And you were like, yeah. That happens for the first few weeks, <laughs> but you, you you get used to it. <laughs> mm. So, I I mean, I guess my question for you is, how did you get to this place? Like, I mean, there are so many queer people, priests, religious people who just kind of keep their heads down. They don't want to, you know, kind of mess with the status quo. How did you get the courage to do something different? And I mean, and you've been doing this since what, like the 1970s? I mean, you've been doing this for a long time. Yep. Yeah, I was um, raised a strict fundamentalist Baptist. Mm. Uh, and I felt called to ministry when I was in junior high school. And I really wrestled with it because I just knew I couldn't be a Baptist minister and have the feelings that I had. But at mm. that, that time, you know, there was no one on TV that I knew was gay. There were no organizations that I knew were gay. Uh, and I felt like I was the only person in the world who felt like this. And so, um, but I knew that I couldn't, you know, eventually, you know, you hear the church talk about sexuality and talk about homosexuality. And and uh, and I remember an incident, I, I do wander a little bit when I talk, so you have to bring me back to the point. <laughs> um, That's classic. <laughs> I, I remember an incident when I was a kid, and I, I must have been quite young because some guys were playing basketball and uh, they were joking about homosexuals. And afterwards, when one of the guys was, was still practicing by himself, I said to him, what's a homosexual? And he told me how to spell it. And he said, look it up in the dictionary. So I remember going home and looking something up in the dictionary. And the next day he was practicing again. And he said, so did you look it up? And I said, yes. And he said, what'd you find? And I said, something about two men loving each other or two women attracted to each other or something like that. And, he, and I said, I think that's me. And I remember him picking me up and sitting me on a fence post and saying, that's dirty and that's evil. Don't you ever tell anyone. Mm. And so I began to learn what other people thought about the feelings that I had. And so, so eventually, you know, being called to ministry and knowing that I couldn't be a Baptist minister, that I couldn't buy the party line. Um, and fortunately, being raised a Baptist, they were wrong about so many things <laughs> that I just, I just lumped it in with all the other stuff. Like, I, you know, they, they thought that I was sort of hanging around with Roman Catholics. Well, my mother was Roman Catholic and the whole side of her family was Roman Catholic, right? I remember one time I went to a Catholic wedding and I, I got food poisoning and they told me that God was punishing me for going into a Catholic church, mm. right? And so, you know, they taught that you weren't supposed to dance, you know, that mm -hmm. uh, women weren't supposed to wear lipstick. I mean, just so many things. <laughs> so, okay, this is another thing they're wrong about because God was my best friend. I had no problem with God. I would go and out in nature and look at flowers, look at a sunset and say, whoa, this is amazing. God, how did you do this? Like, this is phenomenal. I had a problem with the church, mm. you know, and so many things that the church taught. So eventually I decided not to go to Acadia University and become a Baptist minister and instead went to Mount Allison University to become a high school teacher. But I felt like I was abandoning my best friend. I felt like I was giving up on God. And so it began a, a wilderness period for me for about seven years, 
that I didn't go to church at all. And for a lot of different reasons, I, I didn't go. And, you know, church community, and I would imagine the same thing is true for, for Jewish faith communities or, or Islamic faith communities, that at their best, they offer both comfort in difficult times and challenge to be better, to think differently, to be more mm -hmm. open, right? Mm -hmm. And I missed both of those. I missed the comfort and the challenge. And then eventually I uh, met, I went into Halifax and, and uh, went to my first gay bar, absolutely terrified. I remember it was called the Greenlander Building. I remember walking up the stairs, paying my money, checking my coat, walking into a room, standing up at the wall. It was kind of dark in the room, my head down. I didn't dare look up. And I looked up and there were men dancing. And it was terrifying and exciting <laughs> at, at, at the same time. And, um, and then I met a friend there who I went to university with, Harold. And he showed me around town, introduced me to people, and took me to an adult bookstore. And, and this is in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And in this bookstore, there was one shelf of gay material around a corner. Mm -hmm. And I had a copy of every magazine, every book there was, and a stack of stuff I bought. And I remember sitting in my car, my 1972 Ford Pinto car, <laughs> and then a copy of The Advocate, you know, in, in, at National Magazine in the States, US. And I remember flipping through the pages, looking at the pictures, and then all of a sudden there was an ad with a cross on it. And it was an ad for Metropolitan Community Churches out of Los Angeles. And mm. I sat there and cried, because I knew it was home. Mm. I knew it was where it belonged. So I wrote a letter to LA, they got a letter back, they told me about the church in Toronto, and I came to visit, and the pastor in Toronto said something to me that really, really was important. He said, Brent, you need to move to Toronto and find your people. And so, I moved to Toronto in 1976 uh, to be part of the church um, and uh, became the pastor of the church in 1977. And <laughs> that's a fast track. Yeah. yeah. And did it for 40 years. And it's, that's, yeah, that's incredible. It's pretty, pretty amazing because, you know, I say that my role was partly spiritual leader, obviously, and partly social justice activist. And, you know, I, it was weird because I was one of the few people who was open and easily accessible because they could just call the church number and they could get me, right? So I became very quickly someone that the media would call a lot. And I very quickly uh, became an activist. Um, and, you know, in those early days, it was just as bad being gay in the Christian community, but even worse being Christian in the gay community. And because the gay community was so mm -hmm. hurt and so angry and so anti-religion right. that uh, I remember one of the conferences and I was you know, wearing my clerical shirt and one of the activists came out and spit on me. And he said, you're selling out to the enemy mm -hmm. wow. and stuff. And so I really, you know, I really wanted to, to make sure that LGBT people didn't have to give up on God just because of the damage of the, ch the ch church had done, the sins of the church, uh, in my opinion. Yeah, it's a very, that intersection of, of religion and sexuality for a lot of us is very tender. Mm -hmm. Finn, you've kind of, you've talked a little bit about your experience growing up in a very religious household. Yeah. Can you uh, share some, we can check check some of, uh, check some of our baggage, our religious baggage that we have. Yeah, I mean, I was loving what I was hearing, um, Reverend Hawks, because I, I wasn't Baptist, it was Church of Christ. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Yeah, he's shaking his head. My dad was a person Baptist. Uh, well, I mean, it kind of depends on the town, right, or the different body, but the congregation. But um, yeah, it was pretty intense. And I, I would get my mouth washed out with soap and whipped with the belt. And so for talking about sex when I was a little kid, I was very curious about sex um, early on and really precocious as a kid. And um, I there was like a time, I think I was in second grade, actually. And I remember like having to just almost like suck on this bar of dial. Like he was like, you know, scolding me and yelling in my face. And I was just talking to a friend about um, just, you know, how the little kids will talk about sex and be curious about it. And I got to whip him with the belt for that. So that was, that was how it was in my house around sexuality. So as soon as I had inklings around being gay, I was really terrified around that. Um, and I actually went, I mean, I went through all this in um, high school, just, dividing my life and I would go do stuff um, 
you know, like in the woods with people or at bathrooms at the mall. And then we go back to my life, quote unquote, and just feel terrified. Um, and I actually, when I went to college at 18, um, I moved away from home and I was out from underneath the, the, um, the eye of my father, you know, and I was like, oh, starting to experiment with men. And I was so scared that um, I was in this kind of open space where I was like, oh my God, maybe I'm gay. And I think that was just more than I could handle at that time. So I like dropped out of college and went to ministry school <laughs> to like to like kind of run back into the under the skirt, really, I think, you know, um, and that was the Church of Christ ministry school. And then I left that, too, and went on my own wilderness journey. Um, I was super angry and hurt and I came back around to a ministry in a very different way now. I mean, I'm not in an organized religion, but I'm very um, interested in helping to heal this split that you described in, about gay men and our experience of sexuality and spirituality. And I find that all the time that I encounter this kind of like um, mentality, like, oh, that hurts so bad. That religious abuse hurt me so bad. I don't even want to have any kind of inquiry around it. I don't want to have any kind of investigation about my life, or I fought so hard to get to this point to just allow myself to desire that I'm not going to question that or how it's showing up in my life in any kind of way. And I think um, that that can be something that holds us back a lot. So that's, that's a part of my work is to help bridge that gap and say so you can be you can be all these pieces you can be the very sexual animal and the spiritual creature at the same time that wants to ascend and yeah, I mean, what, the kind of schizophrenic existence that society puts us in and between choosing our spirituality or sexuality i'll right. be gay and not christian, i'll be christian and not gay it's yeah. like really really unhealthy yeah um, and what you were saying too about activism i love this because in my mind they're not even separate things not like activism or, you know, religious or spirituality, I'm thinking like, yeah, let's all care about these things. Let's all care about spiritual parts of ourselves, the world, social justice, and really connect as community, find all the, the, the ways that we can connect versus like ways we can fracture, you know? Yep, yep. So, you know, I mean, the, the, both of us in terms of talking about being, being younger and knowing more about ourselves while we're at home, but really not coming out until we get out from underneath of our family. Uh, I think that, that, you know, sometimes people will say to me, well, young people have it really easy today. And I say, no, they have it harder. Mm. They're coming out when they're still under the control of their families and they're still being bullied at schools, mm -hmm. et cetera. I didn't have to go through any of that until I was out on my own with my own job in my own home uh, and could have whoever I wanted over it as often as I wanted and as many as I wanted uh, without my, you know, my parents knowing or getting upset. And many young people today are, are, are going through some of those same kinds of things, but still while they're at home uh, and under the control of their, their parents. And that's, I think, really difficult if they don't have good supports. Hmm. When, when I was uh, 17, I came out to my family. And I remember, though there was a lot of love in, in my family, when I was laying on the couch, I had my head in my mom's lap and I was trying to tell her that I was gay. I remember being acutely aware that I might not have a place to sleep tonight. Like when you're 17 years old and if that doesn't go well, like, mm -hmm. and, and that happens for people. And unfortunately, you know, my mom didn't kick me out. She wasn't the most accepting at the time, but has come a long way since then. Um, they actually sent me to our Catholic priest uh, to talk to. And he told my parents after our conversation that um, what concerned him was I was too comfortable being gay and that I wasn't open to changing. Mm. And, um, <laughs> and I was still in high school and I was at a Catholic high school and every day over and over again, you know, we would learn about uh, how gay people were going to hell. And, and um, so now when I see a cross, a lot of times what I feel is, is, Oh, this was a symbol that a lot of people use this as a shield to kind of hide um, their hate behind or something. And yep. um, and I just remember thinking, like, God, like the Bible doesn't even talk about gay people that much. Why is why is everyone so obsessed with this? It's yeah. probably, probably a good question for you. It's like, why are people so obsessed with it? Yeah, it's such an interesting. Why it's such a strange thing to me that that's like the pet issue across a lot of the world. Yeah, a couple of things. I think, um, first of all, 
the, the, a lot of, I, I'd say church, and I don't mean to, to isolate the Christian church, because I think it's the same thing is true of many Jewish communities and Islamic mm -hmm. communities and other communities, et cetera. But, um, but I'll give you an example. In the 1970s, the United Church of Canada, which is Canada's largest uh, uh, denomination, and it's, it's a moderate denomination, and they set up a commission on homosexuality in the 70s. And after about six months of working together as a commission, they went back to the, uh, the body that set them up and they said, we need to, to broaden our scope to, to, study, to study human sexuality, not just homosexuality. And so the Christian church, the, the, the bigger picture is it has a problem with sex, not just homosexuality. Mm. And it's the Christian church. I mean, we live in a, in a deeply sex negative society. I mean, deeply, deeply sex negative. So much so that it's it's almost, what would it look like if it was yeah. sex positive? My God, the world would be radically different than yeah. it is. Today. Like radically, radically different. And so, you know, and I think where that came from uh, in around when St. Augustine was doing his awful stuff around 400 <laughs> AD. And when uh, John Boswell wrote a book, he was a professor at Yale, a gay man, and now deceased. Uh, HIV AIDS, and he wrote a book called Christianity, Homosexuality, and Social Tolerance. When he studied the history of the Christian church and how did we get here? And, and he, in his book, he said, uh, between about 400 and about 1100 AD, society became much more dualistic, not just the church, but society in general. Uh, uh, and, you know, intellect was good, emotions were bad. Mm -hmm. Spirituality is good. Uh, physical being, physicalness was bad. Ironically, male was good, female was bad. And so a lot of this dualism was happening and sex became bad. Mm -hmm. And sex became only okay for procreation. And so what happened to gay sex? It became bad, right? And so it wasn't that, I mean, in the early days of the Christian church, um, you know, there's lots of records of gay people being welcomed and even some earlier marriages than ours, uh, earlier marriages in the, in the Christian church. And, um, and, but it was the church as society, and I'm not letting the church off the hook. I don't think the church got us into the problem, mm -hmm. but I think the church has to get us out of the problem. Mm -hmm. and, st and so I think that as society became more dualistic and as sex became bad uh, and sex became only for procreation, then our sexuality became bad. Mm -hmm. And we were collateral damage in all of that stuff. And so uh, the church became more and more negative. And then when the Bible was translated um, into English in the 16, 1700s, uh, it, some very homophobic readings uh, were, were put into those translations that were not proper translations. Uh, and, uh, and so it kept getting worse and worse and worse. Um, and, uh, and so now we're in the situation where we are. And so as much as religion contributed to the problem, re religion has to contribute to the solution. And that's why I, you know, we see more and more people of faith, not just LGBT people of faith, but heterosexual people of faith speaking up and saying, you know, the way the church made a mistake about how it treated women, the way the church was uh, supporting apartheid in South Africa, uh, the way the church has made so many mistakes. The church is a human institution, mm -hmm. right? And it's not, you know, we say that, you know, Christ is the head of the church, but I wish he was in charge. <laughs> but he was in charge. <laughs> and, you know, people make the decisions. Uh, I think it was Gandhi that, that was asked about, um, you know, uh, Christianity. And he said, I love your Christ. It's your Christians I have a problem with. <laughs> oh, I love that quote. You know, so uh, I think that, that you know, the, the church is a human institution. Like I said, the sins of the church earlier. I mean, homophobia, mm -hmm. racism, sexism. You know, there are so many things that the church has taken on, negatives of society. Mm -hmm. But there's always been those creative voices saying, hey, you know, maybe not that way. You know, maybe that's not the case. Right. Maybe we shouldn't be like that. Right. And so nowadays you can see in many parts of the world some of the people, some of the young LGBT activists are Christians yeah, and are standing up for their activism because mm -hmm. of their faith. That's well, cool. we're, gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about changing the, the status quo, but um, I do wanna mention, I had a, a conversation with this tantric instructor a few years ago and, and he said, you know, th 
and, and he was, I don't think he was affiliated with a specific religion, just kind of a spiritual guy. And he said to me, you know, the, the real church is us. It's the people, it's, it's, it's our bodies. And, and he said, you know, when, when you're in the throes of sexual ecstasy, like that's when I feel the divine. And, and he said, and also he's like, you know, this could be some of the reason why a lot of religion has told us that, you know, masturbation is wrong. It's taught us shame and guilt because, um, in some ways, maybe it wants us to be disconnected from our bodies and our power and our connection to the divine. So instead, we have to go to this church to to, to get that connection rather than getting it from ourselves. Yeah, I, I think I think there's a lot of reasons why uh, leaders in the church have taken on more power than they should. Uh, and uh, you know, it, it it sounds a bit facetious, but I one of my favorite jokes is, "What's the worst thing about being an atheist?" no one to talk to when you're having an orgasm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and people talk about, you know, that, that orgasm is a spiritual, deeply spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Tantric sex uh, is a great way of, of showing that connection because it's a deeply spiritual form of sexuality. Mm -hmm. Totally. So, so let's talk about some of your work. How, how do you change the status quo? I mean, you're, you're doing this with the Rainbow Faith and Freedom. Uh, organization that you started. How do you move people, uh, especially religious people, from point A to point B? And how do you create a world in which you know LGBTQ people feel welcomed and aren't targeted? Yep. Well, I think we were making great progress until a couple of decades ago. I think mm -hmm. a lot of places in the world we could say we're becoming more LGBT friendly, more and more faith communities were becoming LGBT friendly, et cetera. And yet we're seeing now all over the world a rise in fundamentalism or charismatic Christianity in various forms, and we're losing ground all over the world. And so what Rainbow Faith and Freedom is about, it's about confronting religious-based discrimination, religious-based homophobia, religious-based transphobia. When I talk to activists all over the world, they all tell me that the major obstacle to LGBT inclusion the major obstacle to human rights for LGBT people is religious-based homophobia. And so not religion, religious-based mm -hmm. homophobia. Right. So what Rainbow Faith and Freedom is about is, is confronting that in terms of changing hearts and minds. It's not about changing laws. I've done that. Uh, you win some, you lose some, and then you lose the ones you won. Right. But how do you change hearts and minds so that the changes in society are, are more long-lasting? How do you make families safer? How do you make faith local faith communities safer? For years, we've done this hierarchical thing. We've tried to change laws. We've tried, tried to change denominations or faith positions of the you know, Church of Christ or the United Methodist Church or whatever. And that takes decades and decades and decades. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the reasons why we've been so successful in Canada and why, excuse me, but I'm not being competitive, we've leaped frog ahead of the United States in terms of LGBT human rights um, is because our church led the way and we mm. worked on changing hearts and minds. And, you know, and whenever the religious right is able to frame an argument, God versus gays, we lose. And so that's why a religious attack requires a religious response, not a secular response. Mm. And I see a, a fundamentalist pastor debating a secular gay activist. It drives me crazy because it's God versus gays, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> LGBT people of faith need to be there. We need to be the ones arguing against the, the, the radical right mm. and present a positive faith position. So that's what Rainbow Faith and Freedom is about. It's like, how do we, in Canada and around the world, uh, how do we confront religious-based homophobia and religious-based uh, transphobia by changing hearts and minds? And so we're going to do some things like we're going to, you know, the, we're going to take churches, synagogues, and mosques in Canada, and we're going to rate them about how LGBT-friendly they are. And we're going to publish the ratings so LGBT people and our families know where to go that's safe. Mm -hmm. And we're going to give resources to those faith communities that want to do better. But we're also going to rate hospitals and hospices and schools, right? And point out where the homophobia exists and name it, right? And give resources for improvement. So, you know, it, when I went on a sabbatical in 2015, I went to New York, Washington, and Geneva, and I met with most international LGBT organizations. And when I explained to them what I was going to do, because I said, you're probably secular, right? And they all said, yes. And I said, you think religion's the enemy? And they all said, yes. And I said, if I started an organization to confront religious-based homophobia and religious-based transphobia by changing hearts and minds, would you work with me? 
And they all said yes. And many of them said this is the missing piece. Now, we do have brave individuals all over the world working on changing hearts and minds, but they're not supported. It's not coordinated. No one's looking at best practices. No one's mm -hmm. saying if it works in Poland, will it work in Brazil or not? What, how do we change hearts and minds of Catholics versus Pentecostals? You know, uh, mm -hmm. what do we, and so that's what we're doing. It's really, really exciting and it's growing very, very, very quickly. And uh, yes, rainbow faith and freedom. Uh, and we have a website and all that kind of stuff. And uh, it's pretty amazing. Uh, and what is the website right. that people can go to? Uh, Rainbowfaithandfreedom.org uh, cool. is the website. And um, so, so that's one of the ways. And then if I can get a plug in for something else. Uh, the other way that I'm trying to work on changing hearts and minds is I'm doing uh, vlogs twice a week. And right now there's spiritual messages around the, the virus and positive messages of helping people get through. I did one on um, International Day Against Homophobia and Transphobia. Um, uh, but ultimately, it will be much more about being uh, LGBT, being Christian, being religious, being a person of faith. Uh, and, you know, one, one of the, uh, and that's the, the YouTube channel is Rev Dr. Dr. Brent Hawks. I'll also put a, a link for, for folks to, to click directly through the podcast to see that. I have a question, though, because like I think of someone like Finn's dad, um, mm -hmm. who's very religious and and um, and Finn, we've talked about this. I was like, oh, he should come on the podcast so we could mm -hmm. talk. Him. And it would, of course, devolve into that like religious versus gay uh, conversation. And and Finn's like, he's just going to start like spewing like Bible verses and quoting Leviticus and like how do you how do you change like uh, you know a heart and mind of someone that is in, in in that place and has that perspective well i think you know for you know for years i debated some of the craziest of the crazies uh, <laughs> you know whenever there was a, a human rights issue and the, the, you know the media would always call up and they'd get us debating etc and i soon realized that i couldn't change their mind right but I could change the minds of the listeners okay. or listening to the debate, right? And so, you know, I, I think that the challenge is it's, it's not just about homosexuality. It's about how conservative religious people approach spirituality and how they approach the Bible. Mm -hmm. right? Part of the problem all of the world's faiths have is we're all relying on sacred documents that were written thousands of years ago. Can you imagine if the medical profession today was using medical books written 2,000 right. years ago, or the legal profession was using legal books from 2,000 years ago, mm -hmm. right? It, it's a mess, right? It's like um, literal, and, yeah. And so when you have faiths using documents, you know, using Bibles that were written 2,000 years ago, and, and that's okay. I mean, I love the Bible. It's a, it's, it's a record of the early people of faith and what they thought and how they wrestled with the big questions when they got it right, when they got it wrong, right? It's a wonderful history of our spiritual ancestors, right? And it's the best record we have of Jesus' life and his teachings. But the problem is when you then start taking that literally and you make it a rule book instead of a history book, when you use the Bible in a way that it was never meant to be used, then you get all kinds of problems. For instance, you know, when the people of Israel left Egypt and they were going back into the promised land, they said, God said, send some spies into the promised land. And they did. And they came back with a report. And then the Bible says, and God said, go into the land, go in and take possession of the land and kill every man, woman, and child. Like, <laughs> you imagine a yeah. God of love? I mean, that, that never happened. Right and stuff, and it's just as bizarre when someone's a football team is praying that they'll, you know, that God will help them to win the game. Yeah, yeah. Right? No, my God, yes. <laughs> someone, this, someone will, a plane will crash, and someone will say, "I was on the way to the airport to catch that plane, and my taxi was late, so God saved me." Yeah, and then right. God, is the person who took your seat. Totally. Yeah. So there's a lot of bizarre stuff out there, you know, when people take the Bible literally and try to. Uh, use it as a rule book for today and so you know one of the things we have to get at like you know in terms of talking to your dad you know it would be like okay yeah but the bible says that women who commit adultery are to be stoned to death the bible says that young people who are consistently delinquent are to be stoned to death the bible says that that all debt is to be forgiven every seven years Ooh. <laughs> <That's a good laughs> there's no 
thing as a literalist. They're selective right. literalists. They take some pieces of the Bible and apply it, but they conveniently ignore other pieces. Totally. Right? Yeah, and I so, hear that. Yeah. So that's part of the challenge is, is with, with religion is we're, we're, we're kind of stuck when people take our sacred documents and use them as rule books. And so we have to move that away so that, you know, uh, that, that, that people will, will, will treat the sacred documents differently uh, than they are. Uh, that's part of the, the argument. And the other piece is, you know, for Finn's dad, for him to say that homosexuality is okay means he has to say that Jesus didn't die on the cross. It's like fundamentalism has- Yeah, totally that's exactly what he says. Yeah, they have to, they have to take <laughs> yeah. anything for nothing, right? And you can't question any part of it. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what he says. I love that you brought that up. He's like, well, then that will deny the resurrection and all this stuff. And he goes into this whole rant about it. Um, but you know, yeah. one thing that you're describing it, like in these debates, I think like, it's one thing to have ideas and to kind of house yourself in the mind, right? Versus having a real experience of someone, you know, like spending time with people that are gay and spiritual and not being able to reconcile this experience of like, well, that was a lovely time or what a wonderful person, you know, or, you know, and that doesn't really line up with my mental ideas and having to split like that. There's like a big... And then that's really, really biblical. There's a wonderful story in scripture where Peter, Peter and Paul were two of the leaders of the early church. Mm -hmm. And Paul was much more liberal and Peter was a much more conservative. Mm -hmm. right? And so then Paul kept wanting Peter to change and to do things and Peter kept resisting. And so Peter one time was at his home and he had this vision of a, a blanket coming down from heaven with all kinds of animals on it that he wasn't supposed to eat. Right, and yeah. God said, eat. And Peter said, I can't eat that. It's against my religion. And God said, don't call anything unclean that I call clean. And then immediately there was a knock on the door. And there was someone said, come over and talk to the Gentiles. Now, Peter would never, as a good conservative, gone over and talk to the Gentiles. But he went over and talked to the Gentiles uh, about Jesus and his experience of faith. And he came back and he said, I was so surprised because the spirit of God was there among them, just like it is among us. Mm hmm and that's why I do think you're absolutely right. If we can get more and more families to come into our, our metropolitan community churches or other churches that are open and welcoming, it will change. If I, over the years, I saw so many parents come to church that I'd never seen before, and they would come like this mm -hmm. and they'd sit down in the pew, and they would be like, I'm here because I was pulled here. I don't want to be here. And by the end of the service, they were hugging me. Mm -hmm. And it's the same kind of experience, you know, David, that, that you experienced right at our mm -hmm. church. It's a transformational experience to see LGBT people of faith worshiping mm -hmm. and celebrating God's love and celebrating love together. You know, it's 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 an, an amazing, amazing experience. So I want to just tell you a, a, a story, a quick, quick one. Um, this young guy was in our church. He came to me one time and he said, uh, uh, Brent, when I was living in Ottawa, my mom and dad were very accepting of me being gay. They would go to PFLAG, they would go to Pride, et cetera. So I moved to auto, I moved to Toronto. Shortly after I moved to Toronto, my dad died. And so all of a sudden my mom was alone and she was really sad. And someone at work said, Hey Mary, you know, come to our church. It's a really lovely place. We know you like music. It's got great music. So she mm -hmm. went, right? And she loved the music and the sermons were relevant. She joined the choir, right? And she enjoyed that. And and it was a and she discovered God. A year later, she called up her son and said, I have to tell you, I think you're gonna die and go to hell because you're gay. <laughs> Now, she would never have gone to that church if she knew it was a fundamentalist homophobic church. But she went there and discovered spirituality. And she discovered God. The problem was there was a toxic theology that went along with it. Right? But she found God. And in, and in that, you know, was, was, was taught a lot of unhealthy things. And so I think that's part of what goes on with your dad and with other people is they're in a culture where it's their experience of God. It's their life of God. Mm -hmm. And how do they take this one central piece, right, mm -hmm. and start to, to question that? And does that mean other things are questioned? And I think for many fundamentalists, their faith is so shallow because they've never been able to question. They've never oh, been man. able to differences of opinion and they're afraid the whole thing's going to shatter totally yes they will <laughs> yeah very and yeah. kind of quickly 
we were going to say, you know, David, you told me the story of that experience that you had, like, I think a few years ago, you told me about, and I didn't know that this was uh, you, doc, uh, Dr. Hawks, because David had told me about this experience going into this church and how exonerating it was for him and just what he had shared earlier. And now it's coming together in my mind, like, oh, this is you. That's so awesome to, to see the loop. <laughs> Yeah. It was so funny because he did. He went back to his hotel afterwards and he shot a, a video uh, of his experience. He took his shirt off, of course. Um, and, and <laughs> That's awesome. He shot his video and, and his video, <sighs> Dave Wavy Goes to Church. It was uh, for, for a long time. We were telling everyone, go look at that video. Because uh, honestly, Dave, I don't know if I ever said this to you, but in that three or four minute video, you so captured what our church was. It was just mm. unbelievable. Right. So, so thank you. And, uh, you know, it, uh, yeah. 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 That's no, awesome. not so, you with your shirt off. Oh my God. Really? I'm going gonna, gonna, gonna to show what God, what God made. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so speaking, but, but that's another example of the sex negative stuff, right? The right. whole, uh, the whole anger around nudity mm -hmm. and the nudity laws and stuff. Mm -hmm. and so, you know, someone can, you know, get, get, get more punishment by being nude in public or being caught having sex in public than if they beat somebody up. Totally. So, so weird. So Brent, I want to ask you, not to put you on the spot, but speaking as a, a religious mm -hmm. man, a representation of God, someone who has devoted so much of their life to, um, to the church, uh, what would you want LGBTQ people who are listening to know, because I know there's a lot of people listening and I saw the comments I posted on Facebook before we did this and there's just a lot of pain and a lot of hurt. So what would you want those people to, to know? I think that, you know, sexuality is a gift from God. It's a wonderful gift that we've been given. Yes, it happens to be uh, handy for procreation, uh, but it's a gift that was given for many more reasons beyond just procreation. You know, for the, the the intimacy, the enjoyment, the fun, the playfulness, and stuff. And because society is so sex negative, we have a lot to learn about what healthy sexuality is. And many of us are really screwed up, not just because of what the church has done, because many people who are raised in our North American society, the homophobic society, uh, are pretty uh, screwed up around sexuality, um, and, and not just because of what the church has done. So. Yeah, I think the first thing is that your sexuality is a gift. What you do with your sexuality is a gift back to God. Mm -hmm. And to view your sexuality as a wonderful, wonderful gift. And I think that's what's so great about uh, the videos that you're producing uh, and stuff is it shows a, the depth of spirituality that comes through in these videos is really amazing. They're hot, yes, but the depth of sexuality is really, really amazing. <laughs> and, and, and to be able to view them with that spiritual lens you know, and, and the one, the, the tantric one that I just saw, right? right? I mean, that comes through very, very strongly. It's, you know, and when, we, and when we're taught that, that our sexuality is criminal, that it's sinful, and that we're sick, too often we act like it. <laughs> totally. And we act out what they've been saying to us. Yeah. And so, you know, we, we use our sexuality in destructive ways to ourselves and to others instead of healthy ways. So I, I would say to young people, you know, A, sexuality is a gift and learn to be, uh, to, to be more sex positive yourself and learn about the negative impacts of living in a sex negative society so you can minimize the impact on you. And then the second thing I would say is don't let them make you make, you make a choice between your mm -hmm. sexuality and your spirituality. It doesn't have to be this, it can be this. Mm -hmm. right? A healthy spirituality deals with sexuality and a healthy sexuality, I think, incorporates spirituality. And so, you know, yes, you can have it all. You can be deeply, deeply spiritual and enjoy a very vibrant, wonderful, fun sexual life. You just have to find the right community that's going to support you in that. Right. Yeah. And, and the other thing I would say is, you know, get out of those toxic churches. There are places where you can experience spirituality in a wonderful, positive way, and you don't have to stay in those places. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and that's a better segue than I could do for, mm -hmm. uh, I do want to talk for a few minutes about this week's video, uh, which you alluded to. It's called Connect the Dots, and this features the men of Easton Mountain on a tantric retreat. You guys listening can check out a free preview at Himaros.tv. 
basically the video is a workshop that we filmed. Uh, Brad Amberhart is the instructor and the video is to show people how to use their whole body to uh, excite their partner and to connect and to experience pleasure. So the, the genesis um, for this was really that so many people become conditioned by the porn uh, that we consume and, and we do consume it. We don't just watch it. We kind of internalize it. We take cues from it. And when we see the same type of guys having sex in the same order and the same exact positions, I think a lot of us, myself included, you, you kind of tend to recreate that in the bedroom. And in my experience, uh, good sex, connected sex, passionate sex doesn't, doesn't look like that. It's creative, it's dynamic, um, it's intimate. So, uh, and I'm always, you know, it, we have what, 45 miles of nerves and a hundred billion nerve endings. Like, you know, let's, let's use some of them, right? <laughs> God gave us those nerve endings, let's put them to use. Uh, so the guys in this video uh, definitely do that. Brad demonstrates um, different techniques and then the guys give it a try. And I think what's also really fun in this video is to see all these different types of men, different ages, different bodies, different backgrounds, enjoying pleasure and connection. And it's a lot um, more expansive definition of sexy than what we're used to seeing in traditional porn. Uh, and it's also super triggering watching all these guys touch each other since we're still quarantined at home. Mm -hmm. It feels a little bit like a dream world. So um, I'm gonna ask you guys both what you thought about the video. I guess Finn, we'll, we'll start with you. Um, what did you think of it? What what could you take away from it? Um, I actually really, it's one of my favorite videos because of the technique aspect of it. I'm, I'm often looking for, I, I feel like for me, I enjoy things that I can try and put to immediate use. So I was like, oh, I want to mess with this um, with my partner later and it's something I can do and follow along. And I also just really appreciate, um, I think I've mentioned, I appreciate Brad's teaching and his earnestness that he brings to the the healing conversation around sex for sure. Um, yeah, and to the thing about you were saying about the images that we pick up, I so think that we, that I think we pick so much of it up and we might spend years and years trying to unpack that. Um, like, what do I have to let go of in my mind to actually enjoy my own body and this other person and fully enjoy it? And I think videos like this help with a map because even if you don't like do all this, you know, step by step as if as if you know you're following along you just pick up a kind of like thinking about sexuality you pick up certain techniques here and there that can crack that and open it up so that's why i like it for other people viewing as well as just even if you just take one thing away from it it's like oh that's so different than what i've absorbed and yeah right like the guys aren't necessarily like hard they yeah. don't all have six packs like they're different ages like it's like oh 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 okay <laughs> like yeah, yeah, yeah. this can look a little bit different and, and just Brad the idea of, oh well, i was gonna say using the cocks too like i love like the cocky pressure piece and like rubbing together and i mean you know there's like of course these categories of people we all have heard like frittage like rubbing our dicks together or but you know, there's these specific little channels that we can work in you know or there's like this idea of just what Brad was saying about using your cock as this energy um, generator that can be a little intimidating to, to feel in our bodies and like, oh my God, it can like put so much energy into me and I need to get rid of that energy. Um, but I like that it reminds me just to experience it that way and not think of my dick as some sort of like means to an end to have sex in some way, or to, but to actually just like feel it and like feel the energy connect with another man in that way. It's a different yeah, framework. Totally yeah. is. Yeah, Brian, what what um what did you think of the video and and what was there for you to take away from it? Yeah, it's interesting because I'm a bit weird, and so uh, <laughs> I think I, I kept thinking about it as a teaching tool. Right. And I kept thinking, you know, how many videos have I seen about cooking, and how many videos uh -huh. have I seen about healthy sexuality, like the in the comparison, right? Um, and I think you know, would it be amazing if it would be just as usual to see this kind of a video on mainstream television for anybody who wanted to watch it as it was all kinds of other instructional videos that are out there for all kinds of mundane things mm -hmm. right and I, I kept thinking about it you know and 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 also as you know as a gay man you know how little i i, I have ever seen of healthy sexuality 
playful, erotic, fun, intimate sexuality being presented in a non-exploitive way. You know, very, very seldom. And and this and the video just you know screamed at me in terms of we need more of this. We need more of these kinds of videos where people can learn that you know the fantasies that they have are not unusual. That they you know that those uh, uh, most of the fantasies are not unusual. Uh, anyway, um, and that that you know that that people are thinking, other people are thinking these things, and other people are enjoying these things in healthy ways. And so. Um, you know, that's what I kept kept thinking about. And the contrast being, if any, in most churches, if there was a sermon on Sunday that surprised people and it was about masturbation, three uh -huh. quarters of people would have a heart attack and wouldn't even be able to get out the door, right? <laughs> so on one hand here, we see healthy sexuality and enjoying each other's bodies in different ways and stuff and how natural and how good that is and wholesome that is. And yet, on the other side, we have most of society that would be uh, be shocked. In, in your 40 years, did you ever do a sermon on that? That's, that's what I wanted to know. I was like, oh. It's really funny, This and because I wrote this down to another little story. Um, I, I, I avoided the topic for way too long. And one of the biggest regrets I have when I retired is that I didn't do more to help MCC Toronto, the church that I pastored, become a more sex positive church. Um, and I don't know what that was about. I don't know if that was about me or society or what. But I, a few years ago, I preached a sermon on health, 10 keys to healthy sexuality. And it was the first time I did a full sermon on sexuality. Sometimes I would mention things. You know, mm -hmm. one time I talked about, you know, that, that there's no moral value in monogamous relationships versus open relationships. It's how, you, you know, it's how you utilize the different options that you have and where honesty comes in and mutual uh, negotiation comes in and those kinds of things. But but this was the first time I really preached a full sermon on sexuality. And afterwards in the, in the coffee hour, this young woman came up to me and she said, Brent, I'm heterosexual. I'm married to my husband. We were both raised Catholic. Whenever we have sex, we feel guilty. I came to this church to learn about healthy sexuality and I'm disappointed I had to wait to a year before I heard anything about it, mm. right? And so, you know, it, 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 it really convicted me, you know, that, that we needed to be talking more about it. And, you know, before HIV AIDS, we were, you know, before HIV AIDS hit us, I remember at our clergy conferences, we would have people come in and talk to us about s and uh, We'd come in and talk to us about the leather community, come in and talk about the edgy areas of, of LGBT sexuality, so we could learn more and understand more and be a lot less judgmental. And then when HIV AIDS hit us, all that went away. Yeah, and it, we just focused on caring for people who are dying and all of the edginess because we needed funding, we needed healthcare, we needed things, and we pushed it all to the side. And I think yeah. HIV and AIDS it injected so much fear into our experience of sex, which probably disconnected us from from it and from pleasure, and made somewhat of a of a, of a barrier. Totally. Um, yeah. So I did, so when I was watching the video, I, I mean, it, yes, it was it was fun to watch, and and, and there were some pretty hot moments in it. But I but I kept thinking about as an educational tool, and as for young people being able to see videos like this in terms of healthy sexuality, what a gift that would be. Mm -hmm. Right, in terms of their own self acceptance and stuff, you know. So I was, it was very good and wholesome, and I'm not sure that's what you wanted to hear, but it was very good and and wholesome, and and I I, I think a lot uh, of value that came with it. Okay, yeah, I appreciate that. We have some videos that are a little bit less wholesome, but we didn't want to, you know, throw you too much into the deep end. So <laughs> we played it safe this week. <laughs> have me back. Have me back. <laughs> All right, so we have a few minutes left. I just want to answer some of the questions from um, Facebook. If you guys have any questions or comments, you can send them to Davey at DaveyWavy.tv or you can call 612-470-5729. That's 612-470-5729. And we'll put that number in the podcast description as well. Um, so I asked people to share some questions on Facebook. The most common question um, that just kept coming up over and over again were, uh, it was the question was, can gay people go to heaven? And I can't, I mean, it was like, probably a third of the comments were, were, were that very question. 
You know, I, I mean, when, when the fundamentalists say, you know, uh, God didn't create a, uh, Adam and Steve, mm -hmm. then I say, then who did? <laughs> you know, yeah. and that, you know, LGBT people are as much created in the image of God as anyone else. You know, and, you know, God's one of the things that I think God was really good about was the kind of create the kind of diversity in the universe. I mean, when you look at a giraffe and a hippopotamus, you know, look at the diversity that God has created in the universe. It's amazing in terms of plants and animals and flowers and so much diversity. Why wouldn't there be diversity in the area of human sexuality, too? Right. right. And so, you know, so as I said earlier, you know, my being gay is God's gift to me. Like, I am so thankful that I was, and I believe that it, you know, I was created this way. I believe this was God's intention for me. And I'm so thankful. I'd, I would hate to have been a boring heterosexual. Anyway. <laughs> so, but, you, know, look, I, you know, what I've learned and, 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 and been involved in over the years has been amazing. And so, you know, I'm, I, I think, you know, that sexuality is a wonderful, wonderful gift mm -hmm. and that a God of love would never condemn me. You know, God doesn't make garbage. <laughs> God doesn't make mistakes. I'm not a mistake. I'm created in God's image. Right? How, my, how I live my life is my gift back to God. And so, yep, I, you know, I, 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 I'm not sure that Jerry Falwell or Jimmy Swaggart or a certain president might end up in heaven, but I think I'll be there and, and uh, with lots of people, and some of them are going to be very surprised. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So for people, a lot of the questions that they typed in, I feel like we've already we've already answered, but I know people are going to want to know how to get involved with Rainbow Faith and Freedom. Um, what are the ways that people can help out? Well, they can go to our website and check us out. And uh, uh, we're going to be building more and more volunteer teams, both to help with the work in Canada and around the world. Uh, obviously, we have to raise money to do so. Uh, we're going to be looking at some government grants to, to help us, and the Canadian government is really good uh, being able to fund LGBT organizations doing work in Canada and around the world. So looking at that, uh, and there's a there's a donate thing on the website. And for people who want a tax receipt or giving from the U.S., uh, then uh, we have a partnership with the Global Justice Institute in New York. And so donations can go to them for us, and they will get a tax receipt so people can get tax receipts. And so you can make a donation or make a pledge. Uh, you can volunteer to be a part of what we're doing. Uh, for those of you who people of faith, you can pray for us. Uh, that we'll be make wise decisions and that we'll, um, yeah, and you know, I want us to make sure that Rainbow Faith and Freedom isn't this group of, you know, North Americans who think they know everything. Because hmm. usually, I mean, LGBT people in North America really want to help internationally. They're really, really concerned about what's going on in other countries. But usually when they get involved, they screw it up because they think they know everything. Well, I want us to be different. I want us to really respect the knowledge of people on the ground in various countries around the world that we're gonna be working with. Um, and, uh, and so uh, I'm, I'm pretty proud. We've worked for two years before we've launched anything, just looking at what kind of an organization do we wanna be. So volunteer or donate yeah. or pray. Awesome, yeah, I hope people check that out. And of course, we're gonna to link to your YouTube channel as well so people can tune into your talks. I know I've enjoyed uh, watching them as well. And uh, Finn, where can people catch more of you? Um, FinnDearheart.com, F-I-N-N-D-E-E-R-H-A-R-T.com, and Instagram, FinnDearheart. Awesome. And next week, we're discussing a video called The Power of Orgasm. We hope you guys are, are back then uh, to discuss that. Thank you all so much for listening. And as always, more to come.